are, I think we have a, a quorum, enough people to, to get started as we continue looking at uh, Mennonite history here. And uh, this is when we get to uh, the bigger picture, or excuse me, the more local picture of Zion Mennonite history. We've already covered how we got from 1525 to, to here. But uh, now we have our, our resident historian, Margaret Scheller, with us, who wrote the book for the 100th anniversary. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, let's begin with a word of prayer, please, and then uh, I'll take it from there. Lord, we acknowledge our indebtedness to the faithfulness of saints elsewhere and in times before us. And we would also ask the privilege of being part of that great chain of faith, hope, and love going on to however many generations before you come, O oh Lord. We ask that from this time together we would be all the more enlightened and all the more appreciative of what you have done from our births and even before on our behalf. As we pray in Christ's name, amen. So, Margaret, I wonder if you'd start by telling us first about uh, the writing of the book and why and what it was like, and then let's talk about Zion's history. Well, the writing of the book, I'm not doing well this morning. No, that's okay. No, that's, uh, I was part of the committee to plan for the centennial. But the record, Zion has kept up much better records than many churches. Although, between 1893 and uh, 1916, when A.P. Troyer sat down and made out a list of all the members, the people of the congregation at that time. So from, from that time on, membership records are, are complete. Before that, every once in a while I run across something here, so and so was a member of the of time. Quite a few over the years. And 
and that but it gave you less from that less from that area. And as last person of it's people that settled over the order in the order community. They were men like back there as well. But they kinda well, they settled out here. Yeah. Kind of went their own way because I was too too liberal for them at that time. <laughs> Anyway, <clears throat> so Gideon lasts 1876, and there's a period of time there from that time on until early 1890s, it seems, that there were things going on here that is hazy. Help hope, but you hope then when she did the party together, found, found the same thing. There's really no records. And yet, there were more people here. Anyway, there were Amish, the Amish, <coughs> I'm sorry, I, I'm wrong. <laughs> the Amish and the, and the Mennonites were out, came from Missouri out here, some from Iowa, some I think from Indiana, various times and various places, but really no good records of those. And that they met, they met in homes, various places. Various homes, <coughs> but they did. They did. Did meet, <coughs> and uh, I'm sorry. Would it help if I got you a glass of water? No, I, mm -hmm. my, my problem is I can't read. I oh, can't okay. see, see well. <laughs> <but>. <laughs> okay. Some had 
so was not recovering well from a deal or something in Garden City, Missouri. So his wife came out ahead of the, the year before uh, and sort of stepped out the territory, I guess you'd say. And he, he was advised to get moved to a, a, a less stressful climate than Western Missouri was. But anyway, Joseph Schlegel and their Stephen Roth and J.M.T. Miller spent six weeks <coughs> in the valley and, and so was trying to mediate problems up and down the valley. I, I have no idea what those problems were. And I wrote down my book and my part together and didn't have a chance to check and see the whole book if she mentioned those. But anyway, during this period that they were out here, the Amish Mennonites in this area rented the Rock Creek Church over on Wisconsin Road, is it? For two weeks, and, had, and they had a, it was a place to hold meetings. And during this time, the congregation, Zion Congregation was organized, Several folks were baptized, and they had a community service. And it was at this time that Daniel Krupp, or ordained as a minister, and A.P. Troyer, a destroyer, as deacon. And there were 41 charter members, and the date was 22nd, June 22nd, 1893. I can interrupt you a minute. So we're uh, in 2018. We're coming on the 125th anniversary. Right. So I can remember that time uh, in June 22nd. June, right? <coughs> yes. And they continued worshiping at homes as they had been all along. If I also, I was just doing a little bit. Just, uh, I was doing a little bit of research the other day, like what was going on in 1893. If I can move a little bit back yeah, around here, there was a recession. I didn't realize this mm -hmm. for a long time. But it was that was the word they used. That well, it was, yeah, there's a panic of, panic, 18, panic, panic panic of 1893 and the stock market collapsed. Just a few other things that were interesting. Colorado was the first state to give women the right to vote, and that same year, so that hadn't. And it happened before, and uh, oh, uh, New Zealand was the first country to give women the right to vote that same year. Um, I was thinking that's uh, that's when Henry Ford cranked the first uh, uh, gasoline-powered car out of his garage, uh, and that was like 25, 27 years after the Battle of the Little Bighorn. So this was still the frontier. So yeah, so continue. That. I thought I'd give a little bit of background. Right. And the, uh, the Herald of Truth was the church paper at that time. I think it published once a month. And the 15, February 15, 1894 issue, the correspondent from out here, said that Zion was preparing to build a meeting house. The cost was $180 plus donated labor. <laughs> And it was probably used that year, but it was not completed until about two years, for, for another two years. And as far as I can determine, I think it is the same property where, where the Massive Gildas live now. Mm -hmm. Right in that area somewhere. Let's see. And Zion was part of the Western district Amish conference and Joseph, uh, Joseph Slagle remained bishop for bishop had bishop oversight. And then later they ordained a bishop out here. And A.P. Troyer who was chosen by lot and it was a question if it was proper to ordain a deacon to, to the office of bishop. So he was ordained bishop for uh, minister first and then ordained bishop. And Daniel Krupp was another minister. 
Center. He was from Garden City also. And he was a more strict disciplinarian than me. And this created problems. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you. 
<clears throat> other dates of Mennonites here in the Amish and Mennonites in the valley. The Amish group worshiped separately and half, and of course worshiped in homes. <clears throat> but they were, they were no longer recognized in, as an individual group after the death of their bishop, Joseph Scott, in 1907. And I think the last Amish maybe in Oregon died how many years ago now at the Mennonite at the village. In 1906, the Pacific Coast Conference was established. That, that was the Kansas and Nebraska distance. The distance has to change, just the means of mode of transportation has, but it was a long ways at that time. And so they established the Pacific Coast Conference, which included Hopewell and Albany. I'm pretty sure Napa was also a bit of back then. Amish and then Zion and the Fairview Congregation and later Bethel were Amish Mennonite, a part of the Amish Mennonite Conference. And then in 1920 and 21, the Amish Mennonite Church and the Mennonites merged. Also, there was a merger then, and a new, and a new Pacific Coast Conference emerged. And I a, there's a comment I made to hear about Zion. With the uh, I came prepared with a few, but I, now I'm going to ask a few questions. 
but you folks have some of the answers too as well. But let's start with any questions you have for Margaret. Maybe more of an observation than a question, but <clears throat> I think you say in the twenties when they were deciding whether to be Amish Mennonite or Mennonite and driving conference, the whole question of congregational autonomy was was a concern. And that goes around for the current day, that's a question it's in that church today. Still a concern, yes. I didn't mention anything about the cemetery out here, but that was 1898, something like that. Mm -hmm. and the cemetery was established. And that's right. And the interesting thing is that the, the cemetery association ran the church, the cemetery, and so forth. <coughs> I don't know if it was 1921, but it was a new conference organization or when or no after that but because I because this was in 1917 but when we I had set up our, uh, our organization we have as now like now maybe that was what the, when the lead rocks came and would it be would it be safe to say that Zion is here in this location because first of all, people were looking for a cemetery. But they needed, they needed yeah. a cemetery site, yes. And then comes the sanctuary and, right. and other things. Yeah. And before that, it hit me in a small church building? Oh, over, just over, yeah, over on 211. The, yeah. first, the first church building was over there. They did have a name. Yes, it did. I mean, it, Fern Grove? Fern Grove, yes. Fern Grove, Fern Grove. Fern Grove. Yeah. yes. Right. The wooden church that was built here was yes. Zion. This was Zion. This was Zion. Yeah. Yes. And how many rebuildings and additions have there been over the they, years? They, there was an addition put on about, I'm going to say 1920, something like that, as the back of the park of the yeah. church. And then this is the second, the third. third. Okay. So there's a wonderful picture in the book there of uh, the front steps that are just at that level where when you're getting out of your horse-drawn carriage, well, that was, yes. you can step right up onto the front steps uh, and go into the same <laughs> There are more, more of these books are still available. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, and, and, oh, go ahead. If you look at the picture of the building, you can see where it's at. Yes, you can. Oh, okay. And as I understand it, too, the doors the coming door. into the church were... Well, if you came late to church, everyone would see you. Yeah, the door on either side of the, of the pulpit. Yeah. I think that was sort of like a sycamore road class or something. Was men and women's side or not? Yeah. On, on either side of the pulpit. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, having the doors right behind the pulpit is a good incentive to come on time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's interesting that they were built so it was convenient for the buggy to go up level. Now Zion is built so it's convenient for people to walk in without steps. A lot yeah. of people who come there, the Zion is easy access. Mm -hmm. That's some of the churches have been around. Yeah. Which, yeah. which is very important. Yeah. Now I'm also curious, now tell me if I picked up correctly in the book that the Amish Mennonites, am I correct here, that they're sort of that, that later wave of Amish who came out of Europe, out of Alsace and Lorraine in that area, but they were already in, you know, sort of moving back towards fellowship with the Mennonites. And when they came to the U.S., to, and they looked at the other Amish who were already here and thought, uh-uh, <laughs> yeah, things have changed. We're not the same Amish as they are. And is that correct? And so they gravitated in some ways more to the relationships with the Mennonites than with the other Amish. Well, the Amish Mennonites, my understanding of that is that the those meetings, ministers' meetings, mm -hmm. in the late 1800s is when there were those that one, one did not want to give as far as uh, <coughs> any compromise or anything. Mm -hmm. And the, the, that's where the breakaway, the, oh, the ones that refused, what's um, names? Peyton Miller's book. No, I don't know. Um, book? Peyton Yoder. Uh, uh, I can't think of the name of it, but get apart together, I think. 
the Bible class open. That's cool. so, anyway, the ones that refused to give in to any, you know, sort of more modern thinking and like that, remained a little longer. And the others that were called the Hobbish Benites. They were still Hobbish, but they were also. Yeah, right, and one of the issues was Sunday school. That the Amish Mennonites were more open to that, if I remember right. Well, nobody was right at first. Oh, okay. I said this bill was, it took a while longer, yes. Yeah. Okay. And revival meetings were frowned upon for a long mm -hmm. time, too. <laughs> two or three, more than two or three did. <laughs> so, Margaret, when did Zion start, quote, Sunday school? In the wooden church? Or? Oh, yeah. They had Sunday school then. Yes, but I don't remember. That's a good question. I'm not sure. Before the 1940s, because I went to Sunday school. Yeah. You all right? Did you go to Sunday school, Margaret, when you were 10 or? Well, not here, but, no. I, but I did. You did have Sunday school. I did. Where I, I, I grew up. No, I went to Sunday school. Mm -hmm. So when did the Zion Amish Mennonite name drop off? Didn't you say 1960? Well, I it was officially reported then. But it went with the merger in 1920, 1920. The conference mergers. See, the Amish Mennonites and Mennonites. Oh, okay. Those mergers in 2021. Okay, and they became one conference known as Mennonites. Pacific Coast. Well, just add, add, they, the Pacific Coast Conference reorganized them at that time and included that uh, you know, Zion was Amish men when I was at that time. And that's when it ceased to be Amish men. Okay. Well, the old Zion building mm -hmm. had a basement and it was. The one here on this, this location? No. Yeah, yeah. Over in the, in the parking lot? Over right, right, yeah. 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 But it had curtains partitioned mm -hmm. off. Some classrooms, so mm -hmm. could have went way back or something since school started. Mm -hmm. you know, so why else they would have gone basement? Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Well, that's that's the history of that. Oh, also, you know, reading uh, reading the history, of a lot of it. And then my, as you were doing the history, did you ever? You know, were some of the were some of the documents in German or English or pretty much in English or what? If they were German, I didn't read them. Oh, okay. <laughs> no, I, that's, I think probably well, they did preach. They did preach in uh, German though, and the there was a Sunday school class up until late nineteen twenties, maybe early one to one German Sunday school class. So I don't know. Probably the switch was made during World War. One. And the German was not very much. Yeah, that's right. I was, uh, that was another question that I had. The effect of World War One and the anti-German hysteria of the, of the time. Do you remember some stories related to that? Yeah, I think he has stories related to that. Oh, okay. But, uh, I mean, there are some good accounts of that in her other book, or that part together. Uh, yes. Okay. There's a chapter on my mind. Oh, okay. And Ed yeah. Yoder would visit. We, we had some people at the four of us. Okay. And he got word one time. And he, was going, he was going up, going to visit. And somehow the word got out and he said he went, went a different way to get, the, get to the trade. And he left his team standing in the field where he had been plowing. That was a decoy. Of course, that time I was just reading the last evening about that, that he, um, they were advised him to go to Woodward and get the train instead of Hubbard because a gallows had been built at Hubbard, assumed, presumably, to hang him. Wow. And didn't he have a meeting with the Secretary of War, too? Uh, I think he did. Because that's, I think, recorded right. in the book, that's too. Okay. Yeah. How the Secretary of War interviewed him and finally said, let me know what I can do to yeah. help you uh, conscientious objectors. That Eddie Yoder won him over, I guess. That's in the, the play, isn't it? That, that account of... Ed. What play? And the, the, the video, the 
centennial they said they lay about to provide history. I think that account is in that video. Oh, I like to see that. Well, I don't have a video. I have tapes of all the meetings. I think um, John DeBay had the video. Orville Adams played a part in that. Oh, wonderful. I have to check. <clears throat> if we had the video over the archives. Okay. I think there's probably, there's one in the library today, you know. Do you have a way to play that? If it's a uh, video, the video, video VHS, cassette? VHS. Oh, somebody, we ought to be able to scare one up somewhere. We have one. <laughs> we have one. I have one. We can watch it together. Yeah. I haven't seen it since 1993. <laughs> It's time to look at it again. Yeah. yeah. That ought to be digitized. Yeah. Yeah. Lauren volunteered. I don't know how to do it. <laughs> but you got the VHS? Yeah. I have a player. <laughs> <laughs> okay. But how do you change it? Oh, I don't do that. I have no Take player. it to Costco. Oh, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah. I, have, I have a question that's not specifically about Zion. When did the GCs and the OMs come into one conference, and why did they do that? Was that within the last 25 years? Yes. yes. That's 19, I would say 94. Around 95. Or, yeah, I think 95 was the vote that said, yes, let's do it, joint conference in St. Louis, I think. And then, um, and then uh, just around 2000, it was finally official. Um, really? That recently? Yes. Wow. Um, and why did they combine? I, I was in on that through the mission board, so I can really, but Margaret had that part. Oh, yeah. yeah. Um, there were a lot of things, well, urbanization was a piece of that. Mm -hmm. um, uh, young men and I folks, especially from either of the churches, rural church, rural GC churches, general conference churches, say in, in Kansas and Nebraska moving to big cities and people moving, say from what the old, old order, not old order, sorry, old, what they called old Mennonite church or the Mennonite church that Zion was part of, mm -hmm. also moving to these places and uh, they were forming new urban churches together that had dual affiliation and uh, I, Becky and I joined a church that was like that and then the church I pastored in Minneapolis was also a dually affiliated one so you can imagine that means two regional district conferences and two national conferences uh, and then four sets of documentation going on there and since we were already doing MCC and voluntary service units together there were just all these things constantly drawing us together. Um, there were also um, projects overseas that we were often doing together, either through MCC or uh, joint mission endeavors. And when I can remember in Burkina Faso trying to explain to somebody about, well, you know, the, the OM and the GC and a number of other Mennonite denominations are in together here on Africa Inter-Mennonite Mission. And I, I just watched the look of confusion on them faces, you know, and, and living as they are a minority and uh, in their culture, like, we really don't have the luxury of all these different differentiations, you know. So uh, I think there's some, there's a little bit of pressure from overseas saying, come on guys, get it together. So I think that's why they move towards each other. Now I remember some of the, the grief, the folks from the General Conference Mennonite Church tended initially to have more of the background from the Russian Mennonite, low German speaking groups, whereas what they called the old Mennonites tended to have more of the Schweitzer Deutsch and the Swiss Amish Alsatian background who had been there beforehand. That, that got messy too. Um, and where I served in Kansas, the church I served, they told me, this is a diverse church. And I thought, what? <laughs> I just came from Detroit. This is a diverse church. <laughs> what do you mean? And then I started to realize that some of the folks that had gone to Ukraine also had Swiss, Amish, Alsatian background. And so you, after a while, I started to realize, oh, yeah, this church here in Kansas is, um, has more of the Swiss, Amish background. And this church has more of the 
Dutch, North German, Low German speaking group, and McPherson, the first Mennonite there, started out of both groups, and well, that explains a few things around here. Uh, so, uh, so when I was explaining, um, you know, the the integration of these two denominations, I could tell, you know, the majority of that church came from the Swiss Amish background, and I said, really, when you go back far enough, there wasn't all that much difference. That you know, some of the Yoders and Schwarzenbrugers and others in your family history are also um, in their family history. It's just that way back in the late 18th century, or excuse me, the 19th century, some of your ancestors were going to America and some of your ancestors were going to Ukraine. But now here you are back again. But I think, yeah, there was some grief on both in both groups saying, oh, we're going to lose some of this history that we've had. And I, I understand that and empathize with that. Well, you said that about what brought these two together very, very good. I think maybe in addition to that was in 93, the Confession of Faith was written by yes. both groups. Right, so right. They had the same Confession of Faith. Right. Why not be together? Yeah. That's important, too. Yeah. Which is a reminder that next week we'll start looking into that. So take a copy with you if you don't have it. There's an article in the most recent Better Life World, yeah, Better Life World Review, about Frank, not Frank, yes, it was Frank Cody Conference where this break really took place, 1847. Yes. And uh, about a time coming together again, the two conferences. Mm -hmm. And for Frank Cody, what is it? But I'm not sure what the name of the Easter one. Yeah, the Easter, Easter Men, and that's a good point too. Right, when the uh, the Russian Mennonites came and started, actually they joined the General Conference Mennonite Church, which had already started there in Eastern Pennsylvania from some break-off groups who wanted to do some different well, things at the Sunday school. Yeah, and uh, keeping records of things, you know, they yeah. were really more organized that way. Yeah. Any other uh, questions that you all have? Well, I've got a few more I wanted to ask, and maybe these will generate some more too. So how many churches has Zion been part of starting? And one generally. And some of you may have memories around that too. Well, there's Meadow Brook, there's Silver and Hills. Mm -hmm. Those are both early 50s. Ranch Chapel. Which one? Ranch Chapel in Central Oregon. Ranch, Ranch Chapel. Yes. Okay. Excuse me? Okay, so that's three. There was this. Oh, go ahead. Excuse me. Probably the Harrisburg will be back when. That was not a church plant that was going to the That was a, yeah, okay. a separation. Okay. And there's a <clears throat> Pacific Covenant more recently. Right, Pacific Canada. Covenant. 1944, I think it was the start of Calvary that was a split that was a, from Zion. How did Bethel get started? Uh, Bethel, was, uh, the, there were people who moved to that area, and Zion, and I think, oh, well, took turns for taking the preachers going out, and they met in various schoolhouses mm -hmm. and fighting with them. I think 1919 was the date for an organization of the congregation. In the summertime you ate this, and the wintertime you the <laughs> your wheels you muck and took the mud out the wheels. The Bethel history that I read said that was it. And yeah. It was the distance. Distance. Mm -hmm. And people that had moved over that yeah. to that area. So that's yeah. people that were attending Zion and moved well, there. Well, that like people that were. Yeah. Uh, about Hopewell, how did that? 1899 is the date for Hopewell. I'm not sure. The, I, I, the wise and wherefores, but they they chose to be Ben and I, rather than, I had them somewhere in my notes here, rather than the Amish one. Kind of a toss up, which they were. So, is it safe to say that there really were a variety of Mennonites and Amish and Amish Mennonites moving into the area around, uh, you know, on the Oregon Trail in the last days of that? Yeah, right. Well, the, you take the Sycamore Grove congregation. The history of that says there were people in that congregation from 20 different backgrounds. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> and, 
Isn't there some <clears throat> Mennonite connection with the Smyrna Church? This what? Smyrna. Uh, it's not yeah, the yeah, yeah, well, the Yoders established Smyrna because they didn't hope what was too, our inside was too, too uh, liberal for them in those days. Mm -hmm. They moved out, that, that kind of, those Yoders came out from Illinois and from the congregations there that were kind of involved with these preachers, the ministers meetings over those years. Well, what about Elliot Prairie? When and how did that start? I don't know. It, it was not. Men and I, yeah. men and I weren't involved. I think they were all I have, we have information over the archives, but I don't. Yeah. And let's let's see if we remember this. Who has Zion sponsored to serve overseas, either mission boards or other agencies? What's Zion's international outreach been? Big buyers. Big, okay. And she's still going strong in that. <laughs> in Mexico with the uh, Maranatha ministry. Would that have been the first to send somebody? Seems like in the books is there was somebody from Gladys Weaver was connected somehow and I've never and where did she go? In India. Well she was in India. In India, okay. And then of course there's Karen Wendell going to Bolivia. And that was interesting because uh, when I was first connecting with Zion and there was a first communication about would you be interested in serving here if we talk more? And I picked up on Wendell on Karen's name. Do I know that name from? And that was from serving on the mission board at the time that the two denominations mission boards were coming together. So we were reading each other's reports. Oh, that's where it, that's where it came from. Um, who else? Overseas or maybe in some other, uh, maybe even in the U.S. Uh, we had... Uh, what do we remember about any um, see alternative service people or um, voluntary service people or anything like that? Well, Portland Mission was that somebody from Zion? Got that? It's part of it. It did several stops to get my <laughs> Yes, right. Somebody started a list trying to get everybody's name back. Pat's, Pat's working on that. What happened to it? I don't know. She's it's quiet. hard to keep track of everybody. Yeah. <laughs> well, have you, are there any people here done? The all well, turned wound up in Denver. Mm -hmm. And Denver. what were you working? What, what were you doing? File clerk and x ray department. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh, Ken Beach, he was in. Oh, Algeria. Algeria. Yeah. That was, I did. That was PAX. I think. That was PAX. That was PAX. Mm -hmm. I did one time in Portland. Okay. In Hospital. Emmanuel Hospital. Okay. I did and one time. Graper did too. Sorry. Yeah. In Albion, Michigan. Right. Okay. Taught at a private school for emotionally disturbed boys. Hmm. We were in Kentucky for the years. We had a lot of our father's generation in uh, CPS camps around the country. Okay. Yeah, John's dad was there. Okay, doing well. Um, John Carter was there. Vernon yeah. Taylor. Yeah. 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 No, we were in there. No, he, was in, he was a medic in the army. Oh, that's right. He was a medic. Les Taylor was in the smoke jumper side. Okay. okay. And I have some films of those that need to go to the archives. Yeah. <laughs> Now we have a few um, veterans buried in the cemetery too. But I remember the from World War One, the Dietz brothers, um, and their bodies were brought back and buried here. So I, I know the, um, the the some the few members who have gone in the military service that that um, it's related to some controversy too in the church history. I believe Earl Carnegie was a C 
seagoing cowboy. Okay. Pretty, pretty sure he was.
became members in 1917, a year, year after my mother was born. 1917, okay. which is a risky time to come because of the anti-German hysteria. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Zion's Vacation Bible School has been a, yes. a real impact on the community for as long as I can remember. Wow, okay. Our, our, our childhood school friends in my era came with us, and that's still true today. Um, it'd be interesting to know what percent of the actual attendees are, it's a small percentage of them that are actually from Zion. Most of them are from that community. Yeah. Another impact is in education. Here at 91, of course, a number of Zionites, yes. even in the whole area, various schools. Zion has had teachers or administrators. A lot of younger. The first three principals down here in 91 were Mennonite. Well, mm -hmm. including uh, Floyd. Floyd. Yeah. Lonnie Floyd. Floyd. And, uh, Ron Kim. Uh, Ron Kim. Oh, yes. Yeah. The last three choir directors at Canby High mm -hmm. were Mennonites. Bob Lance, Tom Gingrich, and then now Brooks. Okay. And had a real impact on that. Music. How long has the quilt workshop been going? Four to five years, something give, yeah. give, give or take one or two. Mm -hmm. Well, that brings us to 10:30. Um, so thank you very much, Mark. Uh, sorry, I was so. Oh, it's very. It wasn't a good day. But that's okay. Yeah, thank you very much. And uh, yeah, we're just uh, two years, less than two years away from celebrating the 25th. Um, next week, let's get into the Confession of Faith and the Mennonite Perspective. We'll just start talking about that, just read from the beginning, because I think it just goes wonderfully, uh, one piece from beginning to end. Um, so we'll start with that next week. I see it's going maybe about two or three more weeks on this. And thanks, Lynn, and your class for being willing to, to host this and do this too. And thanks, John, for recording. This is very